So I thought today I'd talk about the backbone of Tau forces, the general troops that you're going to see. I'm going to talk about fire warriors. What used to just be called fire warriors has now been sort of split into a few different units the breacher teams and the strike teams. I'm going to talk about them, their options, how they can be used in game, all the different varieties and things we can go to. For new players especially, if you pick up a Tau army, you're almost certainly going to have some variety of fire warriors. You don't have to, obviously. You never have to take any units. But they're one of the few troop choices in the codex and they also come as part of a lot of box sets now the box for fire warriors that you can get currently has a lot of options to it you can equip them in a variety of ways and you can actually make the box come out as two different units uh, obviously not from the same box you have to choose one of those two units to make so let's get started We'll start with the originals. What I used to call just fire warriors are now called strike teams. So I'm gonna open this up and we'll get into we'll get into the start with some stats. From the last edition, they haven't really changed all that much, but the unit size is one of the few differences. So it used to be you could take a five-man squad all the way to a 12-man squad. But now, they only allow 10 soldiers, 10 guys in the squad. That was a five, 10, there we go. Um, so yeah, you can't, you can't take fewer, you can't take more, you can only take 10. This is, I think, a good thing and a bad thing at the same time. Uh, you don't get that customizability that you would get by having smaller teams. You can't mi have minimum squads, but it also takes away some of that choice or the, the overwhelmingness of having that choice. You can just, okay, I have to take 10 in the squad. So 10, there you go. There's the squad of fire warriors, done. So you've got to take 10. Now their stats are largely the same. They move six inches, weapon skill five plus, we're talking about Tau. Ballistic skill 4+, plus, strength 3, toughness 3, 1 wound, 1 attack, and a save of 4 up. The one thing that did change in their stat sheet is that they got a boost in leadership. It used to be they had something called Bonding Knife Ritual, which would allow them to automatically pass a morale test if they rolled a 6. That is gone, but what has replaced it is increased leadership values across a lot of the units, which I think is just a little bit better. While you're not getting that chance on the dice to roll and just save a leadership test that would normally have been failed, you're less likely to have to take leadership tests now just because the leadership has gone up. So it used to be their leadership was six and then the sergeant was seven. Well, now the leadership is seven and the sergeant is eight. So just improvements. And a lot of the suits and things like that have gone up even farther in leadership, which is really nice. They can also get leadership boosts from other places as well. Um, I know ethereal, ethereal invocations can help out and also units close to an ethereal model can use that ethereal's leadership instead of their own, which I believe is 10, I wanna say. Yeah, an ethereal's leadership is 10. So that's a further boost if they're close enough to the ethereal to gain that, which is real nice. Leadership 10 is beautiful. So, Let's get into it. The Fire Warrior teams, the Strike teams, can come equipped in two different ways. You can have them with the Pulse Rifles. So I've got the models here to represent. So these are what the Pulse Rifles look like. They're the long rifles. So you can take the Pulse Rifles for them, or you can take Pulse Carbines like this. Now, you can always recognize the Pulse Carbine, one, obviously, the shorter barrel. But it's got that sort of underslung handle thing. I think this is meant to be a grenade launcher of some kind. But that is always underslung there. And that's 
you'll see why I I mentioned that. There's a, a newer weapon with the Breacher team that they put out that looks very similar, but is slightly different. So, you can get the Pulse Rifles or the Pulse Carbines, like this. They have different profiles, of course, each with their own advantages, but I would say that overall, in most scenarios, the Pulse Rifle is really the way to go. There's no point cost to either of them. So if you take a full unit of Pulse Rifles or a full unit of Pulse Carbines, it's going to be the same point cost, 80 points for the unit. And the way they've worded it here is it says any number of models can each have their Pulse Rifle replaced with one Pulse Carbine. So that also means you could have a mixed unit if you so choose. The option is there for you if you'd like to. It's kind of a weird thing to do just because typically you'd want the unit to have the same weapons so they can focus on the same thing, but you don't have to. So there is that option there, and seeing as none of it costs any points, you could have five pulse carbines, five pulse rifles, or six and four, or however you want to divvy it up. Whatever works, you can do that. The other option they get is to have a marker light. This is for the sergeant only. He can only he, or she, I guess. I guess the Tau military doesn't really. Anyways, they can have a marker light if they so choose, but it costs five points. The marker light can be a good option, but it's important to keep the rules of marker lights in mind when you do this. So the marker light requires that regular infantry or battle suits or anything like that that isn't a drone or a vehicle they've got to stay still if they want to fire their marker light because the action you've got to declare it right at the top of the movement phase and then at the end of the movement phase the marker light goes out or goes out by goes out i mean is shot is directed at something so as long as you don't plan on having that unit move at that time, it's not a big deal. But something to keep in mind, because even though it's only the, um, the sergeant that has the marker light, the whole unit will have to stay still, which is kind of, mm, it's up to you. Because you, there are units, again, fire warriors, for example, with pulse rifles, very often you will have them staying still. They've got incredible range. They're very good at holding back objectives and staying put or doing other actions, you know, during the turn, whatever. They're good at staying still and still being effective. So it could be useful. But if you're using them on a more move and shoot type of unit, taking whether or not to take the marker light is something to keep in mind. Because marker lights are great, and having an extra marker light within a unit is really, really nice. It's nice to have them kind of split and peppered around your whole army so that, you know, let's say you've got a unit of Pathfinders that's all got marker lights, and they get knocked out of the game, you know, not all your eggs are in one basket. You don't have to worry, oh, okay, I've still got marker lights here, I've got a couple of marker drones over there, I've got, you know, this sergeant has a marker light, whatever, however you want to divvy it up. So for five points, it's not that bad, but just keep the rules of marker lights in mind if you decide to choose them. Now, sorry, I got a little sidetracked. I was talking about the weapons. So the two weapons, the pulse rifle, the long one, and the pulse carbine, the short one. So the pulse rifle is now 36 inch range for a regular infantry rifle. Strength five, AP minus one, one damage. It is one of the best, if not the best, standard infantry rifle in the game. It's fantastic. Good high strength or high enough It's strength five. It's got an AP value. It's rapid fire one, which means at half range, which is 18. It's not that short. At 18, you're getting two shots with that for each guy. The whole unit's equipped with them. It's quite good. The Pulse Carbine, on the other hand, didn't get much of an improvement. It did go up in range, which is nice. So it went up to 24 inch range and it's assault two, but there's no AP value. 
with strength five, AP nothing. There are certain scenarios where the pulse carbine is going to be better. And those are, one, if you decide you want this unit to be advancing and shooting, because it's an assault weapon, you'll be able to fire with it. Or for that six inch window between 18 and 24 inches, where the pulse rifle will not get two shots, but the pulse carbine will. That's a pretty small window though. That's something that's not, I mean, how often is that? It, it, it will come up, but how often will that come up? So that's another thing to keep in mind. Now, if you're playing a very aggressive army and you want to get, you know, very close up or close enough and just be on the move and shooting, the pulse carbine might be for you. The problem though is that there's the pulse rifle, which is a really good long ranged option. And then the other troop unit, the other fire warrior troop unit breachers just have a superior close shooting weapon. Shorter range, bigger strength. We'll talk about that later. So when the breacher came in, it kind of like invalidated the pulse carbine for fire warriors anyways. It's still, pulse carbines are still useful elsewhere, but for fire warriors, it's like, it's kind of stuck in the middle and it's not really good or as good as either of the others. And there's only one like very particular range window where it shines where the others don't so it's kind of tricky so i i would advise pulse rifles but unless you're playing something a little more assaulty a little more advanced and shoot it's up to you now these guys with the pulse rifles as i had said are really good at staying a little farther back in the field Long range is really nice. They can stay still. They can hold on to objectives. They can fire a marker light if they've got one. They're really cheap also. Um, very, very good at doing that. They've also got a couple of other options. Like many Tau units and Tau infantry units, they can take a couple of drones with them. They have the options to take the standard tactical drones. So those are the three you'll, you're going to see everywhere your gun drones, your shield drones, and your marker drones. So they can take up to two of those, which is fine. Or instead of one of those drones, they can also take something called a guardian drone, which is unique to fire warriors, strike teams, breacher teams. They can take these. It's an interesting one. They can only ever take one. So you can't take two guardian drones in a unit. That's not, that's not a thing. You also cannot take two regular drones and a guardian drone so you'll only ever get two drones in the unit you know choose the ones you'd like you don't have to take the drones other uh, either you really don't it's not necessary and i would argue that it's not really uh, maybe but like having shield drones attached to the unit kind of feels like it seems like a waste of shield drones a little bit to keep the unit alive it's it gets kind of expensive and one of the reasons fire warriors really shine as a troop unit is they're cheap and they can put out some decent firepower. So adding the shield drones, eh, I don't know. Adding the gun drones, get a little bit of extra firepower. That'd be kind of cool, I guess. The markers would be nice to add markers, add marker lights to, uh, to a squad, for example. And it's worth noting, too, that the Devilfish transport has a capacity, a carrying capacity of 12. So you can take your 10-man squad of fire warriors and the two drones in a transport. So that's always an option too. It, taking the drones doesn't limit you out of using your transport. So that's nice. Now, this guardian drone that is special to these units is an interesting one. It costs 10 points, like a lot of the other drones, or about. So you get a four plus invulnerable save, which is cool, which is by the way, for the drone alone, the four plus invulnerable save does not translate to the fire warrior team it's attached to. It's only for the drone that gets a four plus invulnerable save. And unlike shield drones, the guardian drone only has one wound. That's to be kept in mind as well. 
It's a four up save on a one wound model. It's not nothing. But the real effect you're getting and what you're actually paying for is that the unit that it's attached to, let me get the exact wording here so I'm not, uh, here we go, Guardian Drone. Guardian Shield Generator. This model has a four plus and vulnerable save. Each time a ranged attack, so it's ranged only, is made against this unit, an unmodified wound roll of one or two for that attack fails. Irrespective of any abilities that the weapon or the model making the attack may have. Okay, so no wounding on ones or twos. First off, you're never wounding on ones, so okay. But no wounding on twos is actually kind of a big deal for a unit of fire warriors because their toughness three. There's a lot of stuff that can wound them on twos. That means that being toughness three, anything that's shooting at them that is strength six and up will be wounding them on twos. But if they've got this drone, it'll be wounding them on threes. It's not a bad call to take one of these drones. It's only 10 points. It makes the whole unit tougher to wound. It's an extra wound on the squad as well, which is kind of nice. And it's got that little built-in invulnerable save for itself, which is pretty cool. So all in all, a guardian drone may be not a bad call. Now, it, it is 10 points you could be putting elsewhere, and you could be making sure you have the minimum points put into your, into your Fire Warrior teams, but I don't know, that extra little bit of survivability, and it, it ensures that, like, you know, medium-strength guns aren't absolutely obliterating these guys. This will kind of add to that whole resistance thing, and... It'll, it might make your morale tests even easier as well. So not only do they get a boost in their leadership, but if fewer of them are taken out from you know, a shooting attack, you're less likely to have to do a leadership test, unless they're just wiped off the table. That happens too. But Guardian Drone for 10 points, it's not a bad call. The Yeah, I'd say some of these are kind of worthwhile, and then some of them are kind of, you know, whatever. Um, but a nice, like, if you really wanted to kit these guys out, uh, a nice way to do it would be, say, with one Guardian drone and one Marker drone. That way you add a Marker drone to the unit, so Marker light, and you have a Guardian drone to keep everything alive. But also, what's kind of nice is the Marker drone can move and fire its Marker light. So unlike the Sergeant, who is not a drone, it'll be able to move and fire and it won't lock you into either I fire my marker light or I move. You can do both, which is real, real nice. And it would only be 20 points for both the marker drone and the guardian drone together. And again, if you had those two drones and the unit, they could all fit in a transport with a capacity of 12. So you can still do that. And then one last thing, which is kind of similar to a drone, but not quite, is the, what is it called? The turret, the support turret. So that's this thing here. That is a support turret. So I've got mine equipped with a smart missile system, which I think is the better option at this point anyways. The support turret is an interesting one. It kind of is like a drone, and then it also kind of isn't. So when you're counting the number of models in your unit, you don't count the support drone. The, or the support turret, excuse me. So the support turret also doesn't start when you deploy the unit. It's an action you've got to do in your command phase. That's right. So to deploy the turret in your command phase, action, any number of breacher team or strike team, so this is for both troop units, from your army can start to perform this action. The action is completed at the end of your next movement phase. So this is an action, again, that you've got to do and you don't move because you're completing the action. You start in your command phase and at the end of the movement phase, it's complete. So essentially it's, you know, a few of the guys getting there, setting the turret up, it's there, it's ready, and they stay put. 
The turret also, let's say it's destroyed, follows the same function as drones, where it doesn't count towards any morale tests or anything like that. So what's nice about having the drones or the turrets attached to your squads is if they're the ones that get removed, you're not counting them towards any of those morale tests. They really get a nice, a nice boost because of that. So the turret has two options. You could take the smart missile system like this, or you could take the missile pod, which kind of looks like a smart missile system. Here, I'll show you one. A missile pod is basically half. It's the, it's the missiles cut in half. See, that's sort of the look. So smart missiles usually looks like it's got six, and then this one's got three. I don't think anyone's going to bust your balls, though, if you, if you go in and it, you know, it, it looks like this. It looks like a smart missile, and you say it's a missile pod. Forget it. If you, if you paid for the points, whatever, man. Um, so the issue, though, is so the turret doesn't cost anything but the weapon does, so you do pay for it. The smart missile system's 10 points, which is very, 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 very cheap. The missile pod is 20, weirdly, and it's interesting because I would argue that the smart missile system's the better weapon, and yet it's half the price. So that's one of those ones I don't really understand. These are your standard smart missiles, by the way, and your standard missile pods, so smart missile, heavy four, Strength 5, AP minus 1, ignoring light cover, and ignoring line of sight, which is, again, really nice for these guys. It means you can have them, again, at, in your backfield, let's say with a squad with uh, the rifles, the long-range ones. It can add to the shooting, or it can shoot at something outside of line of sight that may be trying to approach you secretly. You can get a few extra shots, pop them over a building or something like that. Ignore line of sight, just shoot fire and forget. It's really nice. The missile pod, it's not a bad weapon. It's a, it's a really good one, in fact. It's just kind of, it's weirdly out of place, and it's, it's expensive. So for 20 points, you get two shots, strength seven, AP minus two, two damage. Again, a good profile, but is it really worth spending 20 points to get one missile pod attached to your squad that you've got to use an action to deploy, and that's just as fragile as your regular fire warriors. Mm, I don't know. I don't know. I think for 10 points less, I'd rather have some more anti-infantry fire that sort of falls in line with the squad and follows that same profile. It can target the same things. Or it can shoot over things and it gets you that out-of-line-of-sight shooting. And I'd say, man, the most out-of-line-of-sight shooting you can find that you can get take it because it's really helpful it's really really helpful and the fact that smart missiles went up to ap minus one is really nice so not only do you ignore light cover but you also get a minus to the shots and it's still strength five which is nice and solid so that's pretty much it for the war gear options you have the choice of two drones you have the option to take a marker light on the sergeant you can take a turret if you like, and you can equip it however you like. Bare bones, a squad, you could get 10 fire warriors, 80 points. Anything beyond that, and you're adding points and points and points and points. So this is what we've got for the strike teams. You've got the two op rifle options from there. The breacher team is largely the same in terms of options. So it does have the option for the turret. I would say breachers don't really work well with the turret because they typically want to be on the move. They, they're the ones with the close range weapon. Here, let's get a look. So this is the pulse blaster, which is effectively a pulse shotgun, if you will. Now you can see why there might be a little confusion. They look pretty similar, don't they? So you can always tell the pulse carbine, the assault two, 24 inch range one, it's got that underslung thing here. And then the pulse blaster does not. So this is what a breacher looks like. These guys do not have gun options. They take the pulse blaster and the pulse blaster only. That's it. No options to swap out weapons, nothing like that. 
As I'd said, they have the same options as the regular Fire Warriors, the strike teams. They've got the option to take a marker light. Again, I'd advise against it, because typically you want to be on the move with breachers. You don't want to have to stay still to use the action to fire that marker light. They can take the turret. Again, action to set it up. Got to stay still. I wouldn't. And you can take a couple of drones, the Guardian drone included. These, same thing goes for the strike team. Um, if you, it could be useful, or you might want to keep them at minimum, however you like to play it. Um, I wouldn't say one's bad over the other, like, oh my god, you took two gun drones, you idiot. Like, no, whatever. I mean, if two extra drones, it could help. In fact, I would say two gun drones attached to a breacher team wouldn't be that bad at all, actually. There are eight points a drone, and it's extra close-range firepower. Not bad. Extra wounds on the unit and wounds that, if they're removed, don't count towards morale tests. Fantastic. Also, you'd be able to fit all of it inside a transport. And I would say that the breacher teams... The breacher teams welcome transports a little more than the regular fire warriors. I'd say the, the regular fire warriors with the rifles, they're better off I'm covering this guy's head. There we go. They're better off on their own, you know, being deployed on the table. You can always put them in transports if you want to. But these guys, with the effectively the pulse shotguns, you want to get them in range, close, and uh, the transport will help them do that. Especially since there is, I'll, I'll talk about that with the stratagems. There's a bunch of stratagems. Anyhow, the Breacher team, same style. You've got 10 guys and girls, I guess, in the squad. The Tau don't discriminate in that way. Um, you've got 10 of them in the squad, but only 10 and no less. No more, no less. So 10 soldiers in your squad. Uh, and then you can add the drones, of course, or the turret. One thing I forgot to mention about strike teams, and this goes for breacher teams as well, is keep in mind that every one of them is equipped with a pulse pistol as well. This allows them, if they are locked into combat, to have something to do in the shooting phase should you want to keep them locked in combat. So it's something to keep in mind. Because if you back out, you can't shoot, barring any rules or things that allow you to do that but typically if you back out you cannot shoot so it might be there might be a scenario where you want to stay locked in combat or your guys have been encircled and you can't back out you've got those pistols and they can fire those within engagement range no problem there's no added cost to pay for the pistols they automatically come equipped with them so it's just a matter of remembering they exist Breachers have got them. Strike teams have got them. Keep it in mind. They all have them. And then we'll get to the Pulse Blaster profile. So this is the Pulse Shotgun. Uh, this got simplified. It used to have three ranges, which is silly. It now has two. Cut it down to two. So you've got the longer range, which is pretty good. Uh, 14 inches, assault two. Strength 5, AP minus 1. Solid. It's, it's basically a pulse rifle, but with shorter range. Now, if you get even closer, though, at 8 inches, Assault 2, the same, but Strength 6, AP minus 2. So these guys want to be within 8, in, eight inches, just inside it, so they can get that awesome Strength 6, the AP minus 2, two shots each, they really want to be close. So having a transport is nice. Finding ways to get them up and get them close to whatever they're going to blast at is really, really nice. The breachers are definitely the more offensive troop option. Whereas I'd say the pulse rifle fire warriors are great for staying back in your own lines and firing some shots if needed, but it's not, it's not their job to do damage. It's not really their job. Whereas the breachers... While they are still troops, it feels like their job is to get up in something's face and then shoot that face off. That's just, that's their, that's their whole game plan. So, same exact profile, just the weapons are different. And the roles are significantly different because of the way the weapons work. So, 
let's have a look here. The things, the similarities between these two are, well, there are lots of them. But in terms of keywords, they're infantry, so they're taking advantage of uh, cover when they can get it and everything else that infantry comes along with. They're also core, so any rules, stratagems, aura abilities, anything that affects core units can affect both of these, breachers and strike teams. They also have the keyword fire warrior team. So this this runs in line with some stratagems and some abilities. And one thing to keep in mind is that not only do breachers and strike teams have the fire warrior team keyword, pathfinders also have it. So if there's something, a stratagem or the effects from a cadre fire blade that can affect a fire warrior team unit, this can target your breachers, your strike teams, and your pathfinders. Interestingly, they get the fire warrior team keyword, even though they're not troops and they aren't traditionally considered fire warriors, they still count, they still get it. Photon grenades. So photon grenades is only for a stratagem. Uh, and then of course they get their specific keywords. Strike team gets strike team, breacher team gets breacher team, done. So. Speaking of photon grenades, might as well transition into the stratagems. So a lot of stratagems actually can affect all of these units. Let's start with photon grenades. So photon grenades, use this stratagem in your opponent's charge phase. When a photon grenades unit from your army is selected as the target uh, of a charge declared with an enemy unit excluding vehicle or monster so that's something to keep in mind if some big scary monster comes charging at you it doesn't give a shit about your photon grenades it's gonna run right through it but troops beasts beasts yeah beasts cavalry uh bikers whatever any any other keywords that aren't vehicle or monster photon grenades are gonna work subtract two from the unit's charge roll each time a model in that unit makes an attack, subtract one from the attack's hit roll. Boom. So, the cool thing about this stratagem is you don't have to roll for it. It just happens. The guy tosses out what I imagine is some sort of flashbang, and the other unit is hampered. Subtract two from the unit's charge, and subtract one from attacks whenever they make an attack. Uh, that's until the end of the turn, so that's not permanent, but it's a, a way to either eliminate a charge or to make a charge not happen. What's cool about this is, seeing as now Tau cannot fire Overwatch with everything, let's imagine a scenario where a unit of fire warriors and another unit is being charged. They're being declared as the unit for the charge, both of those units. The one unit can fire Overwatch, and then the Fire Warrior unit can also use Photon Grenades, because it's not an Overwatch attack. The unit of Fire Warriors is not firing Overwatch. They're just using a separate stratagem. Now, that's two command points to do that, but what you get out of it is the possibility of eliminating the charge, so you're increasing the charge range by two inches. You're pushing them back. You're firing Overwatch with one squad. And if that unit does make it into charge range or does make that charge, they're minus one to their hits in close combat for that turn. So it can be a really cool like combo strategy that you can have. Uh, to help out your other units. So Photon Grenades is a really solid keyword. And again, your Pathfinders have Photon Grenades as well. Something to keep in mind. I believe it's only Strike Teams, Breacher Teams, and Pathfinders, but I think Cadre Fireblades also get Photon Grenades. They do. So Cadre Fireblades also have Photon Grenades. So again, imagine you have a unit of Fire Warriors and then a Cadre Fireblade. Your unit of fire warriors fires Overwatch, 
your cadre fire blade throws a photon grenade and that's just a great way to maybe whittle off a couple of the enemies coming in pushing their charge back potentially eliminating it or worst case scenario they get into combat but they don't hit as well so you can make that work I believe in terms of photon grenades, that's it. Barring the special character uh, for the Tau Dark Strider, he gets photon grenades as well, but he's Tau only. And everything else, yeah, no, none of the suits get it. Um, no drones or anything like that get it either. Yeah, Pathfinder teams have both the Fire Warrior team and photon grenades. Nope, 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 nope. Okay, so other stratagems that we can use. One that I really wanted to talk about, especially with breacher teams, is combat debarkation. Use this stratagem at the start of your movement phase. If you selected the Mont Ka tactical ph philosophy at the start of the battle, and it's the first, second, or third battle round, select up to three devilfish. If you selected the Kalyan tactical philosophy at the start of the battle, and it's the third, fourth, or fifth battle round, select up to three devilfish. Otherwise, select one. Until the end of the phase, each time one of those models, the devilfish, makes a normal move, after it has moved, any units within that transport can disembark. Any units that do so cannot charge this turn. So this effectively allows you to move the devilfish its full move which is 12 it's nothing bad and then disembark that unit as well so when i talked about breachers imagine you want to get these guys in close range so what you do is inside their transport they move the 12 inches from the transport then they disembark which by the way gives you three inches of free movement when disembarking from a transport and then they can move their six inch move so you're getting quite a bit there. You're getting quite a bit of distance to close in and get into that sweet eight inch window where you're getting your full strength at strength six and AP minus two. It's gonna be really, really helpful. Now there's a little bit else to dissect here with Kalyan and Mont Ka. Basically, if you selected Mont Ka, which is the one that's active for turns one, two, three, you can choose three devilfish when you use this stratagem. If you selected Kalyan and it's turn four, five, six, no, three, four, five, excuse me, then you can also select three devilfish if it's on one of those turns, three, four, five. So it's a little, it's a little chunky in its wording, but effectively if you selected Kalyan and it's Kalyan turns, you can get three devilfish. If you selected Monka and it's Monka turns, you can get three devilfish. If it's not though, you can still use it on one and it's still totally worth it for just one CP for one devilfish to be able to move, then disembark and then do your shooting. You just can't charge, but you're Tau, so who cares? That one's really good, combat debarkation. And it makes mechanized Tau very, very, very cool. Then at the beginning of the stratagem section, there's a whole bunch that apply to either fire warriors or exclusively strike teams or breachers. So we'll start from the top. Breach and clear, guess who this applies to? Breacher teams. So use this stratagem in your shooting phase. When a breacher team unit from your army is selected to shoot until the end of the phase, each time a core model in that unit makes a ranged attack. So the reason they say core is because that will exclude any drone units that are in the squad because they don't get that core they don't get it so that just means the fire warrior models in the breacher team are getting access to this the target does not receive the benefits of cover so their weapons just ignore cover that is light and dense it ignores cover and you reroll the wound roll that one's quite solid. So now imagine this. You move your devilfish. You do the combat debarkation stratagem. You get your three inches of free movement from disembarking. You then get six inches of movement for the regular movement of your breachers. Then you throw down this stratagem in the shooting phase. They ignore all cover with their shots and they reroll wounds. It can be really devastating and that's just from a standard troop unit. Quite useful. 
Next one, Relentless Fusillade. Use this stratagem in your shooting phase, when a strike team unit from your army is selected to shoot, until the end of the phase. Instead of following the normal rules for rapid fire weapons, models in that unit shooting pulse rifles may double the number of attacks. So pulse carbines don't get anything on this. What that means is that even if you're at full range, you're getting two shots. So even if you're at outside of the double rapid, that rapid fire range, doesn't matter. You're at 36 inches, you're at the max range, you're getting two shots. And each time a core model, again, the fire warriors themselves, in that unit makes a range attack, improve the armor penetration characteristic by one. So those pulse rifles become AP minus two, and they get two shots at max range. That's pretty good too. Onboard sensors. This is another one for devilfish, but it applies particularly to uh, fire warriors. Use this stratagem at the start of your shooting phase. Select one sept devilfish model from your army and one enemy unit within 24 inches and visible of that model. So the enemy unit has to be within 24 inches of the devilfish and has to be visible to the devilfish. Until the end of the phase, that devilfish model gains the following ability, sensor link aura. So the devilfish gains an aura ability of six inches. While a friendly sept fire warrior team unit is within six inches of this model, each time a model in that unit makes a ranged attack against the selected enemy unit, reroll a hit roll of one. So that devilfish gets a reroll one's aura around it for fire warrior teams, which remember includes Breachers, Strike Teams, and Pathfinders. All of those. And it's not just selecting one unit near the, um, one friendly unit near the Devilfish. It's any of them within six. So if you've got a couple of Fire Warrior teams nearby, they're both getting this reroll once. Quite nice. Then, Pulse Onslaught. Use this stratagem in your shooting phase. When a Fire Warrior team unit from your army is selected to shoot until the end of the phase, each time a core model in that unit makes an attack with a pulse weapon. So pulse carbine, pulse rifle, pulse blaster, pulse pistol. Where was I? Makes an attack with a pulse weapon. An unmodified hit roll of six automatically wounds the target. So hits of six, auto wound. Cool. That one's one CP as well. And then we've got another one, point blank volley. This one I like actually. It's circumstantial, but it's neat when you can get it to happen. One CP again, one command point. Use this stratagem at the start of your shooting phase. Select one fire warrior team. Again, you can get those three to choose from. Unit from your army that is within engagement range of enemy units. Until the end of the phase, pulse blasters, pulse carbines, and pulse rifles that models in that unit are equipped with have the type characteristic pistol 2. So this means that even though you've got pistols, if you use this stratagem, the weapons that you're equipped with suddenly are pistol 2 and can be fired in engagement range during your shooting phase. So. It might not be the most worth it if you've got a unit with pulse carbines. You're doubling your shots, which is really cool. But if you've got pulse rifles or pulse blasters, you're improving your AP, you're doubling the shots that you would normally take with your pistols, and in the case of pulse blasters, for the breachers, you're getting extra strength. So this one can be really useful in the right circumstances. So again, if you're tied up in combat for some reason and you need to stay in combat or you have no choice because you're surrounded, you can use this and at least deal some significant damage to the enemy. Because you remember, you're not fighting with your weapon skill. You're shooting with your ballistic skill. So that can be, uh, that can be interesting. And that about does it, I believe for the ones that are very particular and specific to the fire warriors, to the breacher teams, to the, to the, I'm not going to go over the pathfinder team ones because uh, that'll do in a separate video about pathfinders. So let me see 
if I got everything I wanted to talk about. I've got my notes here. Yeah, strike team weapons, drones, turrets, breachers, stratagems, keywords, the fire warrior keywords, 10-man squads. Yep, yeah, we've got just about everything. So finally, just a wrap up on uses for these. One, they fill out troop slots for a lot of formations. That can be really, really helpful. They're troops, so they've got objectives secured when it comes to holding on to objectives. That's really useful too. The thing is they're pretty weak, so or rather their toughness is low. So it's easier for them to get blown off on objective. That being said, they're cheap, their guns are good, they've got a lot of stratagems that boost them, and they can be put into a variety of roles that they're pretty effective at. The long range ones, good for back, backfield objectives. You can screen out certain gun line units, for example, with them, that'd be really nice. And then the breachers really excel at getting right up close and personal and shooting something right in the face. So a lot of versatility in the two, in the two types of units anyways. And however you decide to put them into use, may depend on your army. I'm not saying that strike teams or breacher teams, one is better than the other. Breacher teams are more damaging just by their weapons, but it just depends how you want to play your army. And you might have a combination. You might have a couple of breacher teams and one strike team. I know usually when I run it, I have one, I like to have one breacher team inside a transport and I hold on to that for a little while. I hold on to that for a few turns and I don't send them out right away. I wait till a little later and then bang, all of a sudden this devilfish zooms out and then disgorges its unit and they all kind of blast something in the face and their troops. So it's a great way to shoot yourself out into the field, get out onto objective and blast something off an objective. But then I also like to have two or three uh, strike teams in the back to hold my backfield objectives, protect characters, or screen things out, whatever. And because their long rifles shoot so far away, they can actually contribute in shooting as well as defending, which is kind of nice. So I hope this helped, and thanks for watching.